I am not seminary trained. I'm not ordained. I have a business background. I have an MBA. Uh, I've been working for the uh, Connecticut Conference and now Southern New England Conference since 2002. Uh, I do have a favorite management theologian uh, com combining both of the worlds that I've been in. I don't think he claims that title for himself. It's one that I've uh, given him. His name is Robert Quinn. He's on the faculty of the University of Michigan uh, uh, School of Business. And uh, he writes book about, books about change, including uh, Change the World and Deep Change. And one of the things he says is that we're always on, uh, we're always coming to a fork in the road. And one fork leads to the path of slow death. And the other fork is the path of radical transformation. And uh, to me, this is the gospel message. This is uh, uh, what is uh, uh, death and resurrection, if not uh, the ultimate radical transformation, because uh, Jesus wasn't resuscitated. He didn't come back the same as he was uh, in human form before his death. Uh, he came back radically different in ways that he continues to be a presence uh, today. Uh, and uh, to me, you know, some people say, why is it always uh, uh, a choice? Why are you always coming to this fork in the road? Uh, if you're on the road to slow death, Fortunately, we continue to have the options of uh, transforming ourselves. But even if we start down the path of transformation, it's not, a, in my mind, a single event that happens once and then you're done. Uh, I think transformation is more like fitness. Uh, you don't decide to eat right, exercise more, adopt a healthy lifestyle and get fit. And then one day you announce, I'm fit, I'm done. Uh, I can forego all those habits. Uh, you have to continue to work on transformation and staying in that, that new place. And uh, I think all stewardship work, what it has in common is it invites people to a transformation uh, in how they think about uh, money, how they think about themselves, uh, how they interconnect with the world, and it becomes a faith practice. Uh, so that foreshadows uh, why I think that this is a ministry uh, and not just fundraising. Uh, I want to point you to our website. We have a, a section on stewardship. Uh, there you'll find a, a series of webinars uh, along with associated resources and materials. And uh, that's there for you and you can uh, share with other people. There is uh, one of the webinars is on planned giving and it's a shorter version of what we'll be talking about today, but uh, hopefully still useful. So if you want to share something with people in your congregation, uh, you can have a watch party. The webinars are each about an hour. Uh, they start with 20, 25 minutes of presentation, uh, followed by uh, reactions from some panelists, uh, followed by questions and answers, and you don't have to use the whole thing in its entirety. Uh, you can use whatever pieces make sense. And there are also uh, lists of uh, books and newsletters and other resources uh, that are worthwhile, uh, some of which I'll mention. Uh, and uh, this is the outline of the webinars. Uh, we went from faith foundations to how to inspire generosity, uh, to learning from the nonprofit world, to uh, planned giving. Uh, why do we uh, want to have planned giving initiatives? Well, Willie Sutton, people might remember was a bank robber. And they asked Willie, why do you rob banks? And he said, that's where the money is. Uh, and so we need to look where people have money and they have income and they have savings and they'll have their estate. Uh, so uh, we have annual pledge drives. Typically people give out of income. Uh, we have major gifts and capital campaigns that invite people to uh, look beyond their income into their savings and assets. 
and we have planned giving for people thinking about what to do with their estates. So we want to find ways for, for people to uh, be generous in uh, all these areas. Uh, why is this a ministry? Um, I would say the stewardship goal is not to get people to give more money. Uh, it's to help people to make more faithful choices uh, regarding what they do with their assets and in planned giving the distribution of assets when they die. Uh, and it's a conversion or transformation process that will strengthen people's faith. Uh, and uh, faith, in my view, is not believing the right things, it's behaving the right way. Uh, and uh, generosity is one of those behaviors uh, that is faithful along with uh, attending worship, uh, forgiveness, uh, Bible study, uh, intentional acts of caring and, and service. Uh, and uh, these and other things all have in common that they might be motivated by our faith, but the practice will strengthen our faith as well. Uh, generosity is one of the fruits of the spirit that's referred to in scripture. So why should people consider a, a planned gift? Uh, well, the same reasons they give to the church while uh, they're alive. It, it's an organization that uh, is aligned with what they're passionate about, what they care about, and that they wanna support. Uh, it's an opportunity to endow a pledge. Uh, if you think the church is worth surviving while you're alive, uh, you can continue to do so forever uh, through uh, a planned gift. Uh, and to me, my dream job was always to be a philanthropist, which is, you know, I hope to have enough money that I could make a living or spend my time uh, giving it away. And here's an opportunity for everybody to be a philanthropist, because for most people, estate gifts are the largest gifts that they'll consider making in their lives. Uh, so, uh, it also gives people an opportunity to leave a legacy, uh, to think about what the impact their life will have on the world, uh, and it adds meaning and satisfaction to people's lives. And I have worked with people to help them set up planned gifts, and uh, I've talked to people who have done so, uh, and people feel really good about the choices that they make. and. Uh, I, I can cite any number of examples, but uh, 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 Harry Baldwin comes to mind. He made a generous gift to the Connecticut Conference. His passion was uh, interfaith ministries and finding common ground. And so uh, he set up a, uh, a life income uh, gift to benefit the conference for that. Uh, and he talked frequently about that. In fact, he decided to give some money while he was alive to start some of the programs because he was so excited about the idea. So, uh, and, and I don't want to uh, overlook, some people may feel like they wish they had done things or been more generous and it, it's still not too late. Um, uh, I'll send out these slides. Uh, you don't need to try to write things uh, down. You can take notes, certainly, if you'd like to, but I'll be happy to send you the slides. Uh, more reasons for planned giving. Uh, giving while you're alive, some people would say involves trade-offs. Uh, some would even say sacrifices. Well, uh, after you're gone, uh, it's, it's painless to, <laughs> to give away. Uh, the assets, uh, as they say, you can't take it with you. Uh, some practical considerations. Uh, you can uh, use planned gifts to avoid taxes uh, on your estate. Uh, you can find ways to increase your current income, uh, particularly your after-tax incomes. Uh, there may be ways to unlock property value uh, and uh, this gets a little more complicated, but an example would be somebody that donates their property, their house, uh, to the church with an agreement that they can live in the house until they die. Uh, and uh, then the, the church uh, has the, the, the benefit of having that asset. 
so those are complicated sorts of arrangements, but I, I just wanted to mention it because it might stimulate people's uh, thinking about opportunities. And uh, most uh, planned gifts are revocable. People can change their minds. And so that may give comfort to some people while they're considering a gift. Uh, anyone can give away a million dollars. The secret is not that life is so short, it's that you are dead for so long. Uh, and, uh, you know, I work with endowments, the oldest endowments from the historic Connecticut conference uh, go back to the late 1700s. Uh, an endowment fund was created to fund mission work in the Western territories. Uh, and uh, uh, we still have those endowment funds. Uh, so how can you give away a million dollars? Well, if you have the resources to give away $100,000, uh, that will generate very conservatively $4,000 per year. Uh, so after 25 years, that's 100,000. And after 250 years, that's a million dollars. Uh, and um, uh, as I said, uh, we have endowments going back to before 1800, which means they're over 220 years old. Uh, endowments are immortal. So uh, the giving goes on and on and on. Uh, but there's other ways. Uh, you could take that same $100,000 and if you said to the beneficiary, don't spend any of this money until it reaches a million dollars, uh, at a reasonable annual rate of return of about 8%, uh, it takes about 30 years for 100,000 to become a million dollars, which is shorter than many people would guess. Uh, compounding growth, uh, exponential growth, uh, uh, people don't have a good intuitive grasp for that as uh, the pandemic is uh, demonstrating. Uh, you don't have to make a large bequest. Uh, the conference uh, has the Silver Lake uh, Conference Center uh, and uh, we've told people for $10,000, you can endow a summer camp scholarship, uh, which would send one child to summer camp uh, each year and, and that touches one person a year and after 10 years that's 10 and after 50 that's 50 and that's not a trivial thing uh, to accomplish with your $10,000. Uh, I mentioned endowing your pledge. Uh, the rough rule of thumb would be giving 25 times your annual pledge. So if you pledge $1,000 to the church, give $25,000. Uh, and for many people, uh, that's not going to exhaust their estate. It's not going to keep them from leaving money to their family or heirs or other organizations. It's kind of like saying, well, I wanted to give a portion of my money uh, to the church when I was alive. I'm going to do that uh, when I die. And, uh, you know, for churches, from the church perspective, you know, imagine if uh, people started doing this 20 or 25 years ago, and maybe now you had 20 or 25 endowed pledges on top of the living members of your congregation, uh, that would make a real difference uh, in the life of most of our churches. Uh, there's lots of ways to make planned gifts. Uh, you can do it through a will. Uh, but uh, it's even easier sometimes to just name a death beneficiary on a financial account or retirement account. It's a, it's a one page form, you fill it out, you sign it, you hand it to your financial institution. Uh, and <clears throat> it's quick, it's easy, and it's revocable. Uh, you can donate life insurance policies by either you can make the church the beneficiary of the policy or you can donate the policy itself. Uh, and you can donate property. Uh, so uh, on the receiving side, be very careful about accepting property without uh, carefully examining whether it comes with any uh, liabilities, but it is something that people can give. Uh, I mentioned uh, Harry Baldwin, who set up a life income gift. 80% uh, of planned gifts are uh, bequests or distribution of financial accounts. Uh, about 20% about of life income gifts 
what they all have in common is that you make an irrevocable gift. Uh, and while you're alive, that gift generates income to you. Uh, and when you die, the residual amount goes to your beneficiary. Uh, this can be very advantageous because you get a tax break uh, for making the gift. It can reduce the taxes on your income and uh, charitable gift annuities have defined uh, distribution rates based on your age. Uh, and so you may be able to get a much higher rate of return on a life income gift than you could get on any other kind of investment available to you now. Uh, so it, it, depending on how old you are, it could be, you know, six, seven, eight percent per year. Uh, and some of that would be uh, tax free. Uh, and, and, and with life income gifts, you cannot outlive uh, your, your gift. The, the recipient is obligated to continue to pay you uh, uh, regardless. Uh, these things are set up uh, actuarially so that on average 50% of the original gift goes to the, uh, the charity and 50% ends up going back to the uh, donor as income. But that will vary a lot depending on investment performance and how long somebody lives. Uh, so it's just important to know that these things exist. Um, and so I've, I've, I've gone through the, the benefits more after tax income, higher rate returns, gift deductions. If you've got appreciated stock, uh, this is particularly advantageous uh, because you, you get to the benefit of the appreciated value of the stock without paying the capital gains. Uh, and I said, you can't outlive uh, the income. Uh, there is some you know, important things to know. The gift is irrevocable. You, know, you can only uh, specify one or two people to receive income during life. Uh, recipients have to uh, meet minimum age requirements. There are minimum gift amounts and there will be some administrative fees for these things. Uh, <clears throat> the United Church of Christ does have uh, staff in New York and a law firm and United Church funds, which will act as a custodian of the funds. So you don't have to invent anything from scratch uh, to set this up. You can work through the United Church of Christ. Uh, planned giving is a big missed opportunity because while people are alive, about 32% of their giving goes to churches and religious organizations. That's the number one area that people support. Uh, the bad news is a generation ago that was 60% of giving went to religious organizations. Uh, but less than 10% of planned gifts are going to churches and religious organizations. Uh, and the, there's trillions of dollars at stake here. So uh, getting even a small amount of estates can make a big difference. Uh, and the reason why uh, so few of the planned gifts are going to the uh, church is that we're really terrible about inviting people to make these gifts and colleges and universities and hospitals and the Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts and uh, all these other organizations uh, are doing a better job. And the ironic thing is that they would love to have the opportunity we have to cultivate planned gifts because we are in a close relationship with our potential donors. You know, a college or university is trying to reach back over years and decades to maintain a connection with alumni whose experience was long ago. We have, in most cases, current experiences uh, with people and, and at least prior to the pandemic, we're often seeing them on a regular basis. Uh, so we're, we're missing this opportunity. Uh, to set up a planned giving ministry uh, in the, the four easy steps, and these steps come from Len Clough. Uh, Len uh, was ordained and worked on the national staff of the United Church of Christ uh, for many years doing planned giving. And he said, you need a case statement, you need some policies, you need prospects, uh, and you need to solicit or ask people. Uh, now, I'm, I'm going to give you the whole 
most important message of this workshop right here. Uh, asking people means asking. It's not sending a letter. It's not making an announcement in church. It's not inviting them to a workshop on how to make a planned gift. It's sitting down with somebody face to face and uh, having the asking team, a member say, I have made a planned gift to the church. I want you to inv in, uh, invite you to join with me in making this kind of a gift. Uh, that is what is really uh, the foundation of effective plan giving programs is asking people. Uh, and we get all wound up in education and creating brochures and marketing materials. And in a way, it's all a way of, of deferring or postponing the task of asking people. And while you will get some gifts uh, spontaneously, you will get some gifts by reminders or announcements, uh, but the churches that have effective planned giving ministries have learned how to ask people. Uh, and so we'll be talking a lot about that. Uh, so of the four things, your case for support, uh, why are you asking? Uh, the, what the world needs and what your mission is, what the impacts of the gift. You can't assume that people will just understand uh, the benefit uh, of making the gift. Uh, you need to say something about your theology of stewardship and wealth, uh, which might start with a statement that all that we have is a blessing from God, uh, and God yearns for us to to be generous uh, with the, the resources. Uh, you can talk about extending the mission and ministry of the congregation beyond the resources of the living members. Uh, you might want to feature specific aspects of your mission and ministry to be funded with planned gifts. Uh, you may want to speak to people about sustaining uh, facility and staffing models that are becoming more challenging to maintain with just living members. Uh, although I, I will say some words about being careful what you ask for because uh, you, you are creating, uh, in a sense, a contract. Uh, so your case can become a gift instrument, uh, which is if, if you write something down and hand it out to people, more typically with a capital campaign, uh, you're obligated to use the money according to the terms of the solicitation. So as I said, be careful what you wish for. Uh, you should strive to inspire people to make unrestricted gifts because that's a gift that gives twice. It allows uh, the future members of the church to discern what God's call is in that moment in ways that we might not be able to anticipate uh, today. Uh, and when donors put a restriction on something that is legally enforceable, uh, and uh, if <clears throat> you solicit funds for a specific purpose, that's a, that creates a restricted gift. Uh, so uh, your, your solicitation becomes a gift instrument. Therefore, you always want to give yourself some flexibility when asking for gifts. For instance, in a capital campaign, if you have a written solicitation, it should always say something like, if we are so fortunate as to raise more money than the target for the campaign, uh, the amount in excess will become unrestricted gifts to the church. Uh, uh, otherwise, you can uh, be in a, a difficult situation. And uh, if you have a planned giving ministry, you might consider setting goals. We would like to generate enough of an endowment to uh, be able to care for the uh, ongoing maintenance of the building, or uh, we'd like to grow an endowment that will uh, provide for our music ministry uh, out of the endowment funds. Uh, and that'll give something to give to. Uh, when you're thinking about the why, the case statement, uh, Simon Sinek is a speaker and author uh, he has one of the top three TED Talks of all time uh, on his Golden Circle. 
which is the center of the circle is why, uh, then what, and outside of that is how. And he said, most organizations are very good about talking about what they do and how they do it, but to really connect with donors and their passion, you have to talk about why you are doing it. Uh, it's worthwhile to uh, watch this video. Uh, I do want to quickly uh, go through, there's a difference between an endowment and a, a quasi endowment. Uh, endowments can only be created by donors. Uh, your paramount concern is fidelity to the donor's intention. Uh, you have to preserve the permanent corpus of the gift. Uh, and if there are restrictions on distributions, you have to observe them. Uh, endowments are immortal, and if it doesn't support the mission of the church, you have to find a new owner for that endowment. Or if a church closes, they have to transfer the endowment to somebody else. Uh, <clears throat> donors create restrictions, and restrictions are legally enforceable and cannot be changed without judicial approval. Uh, churches sometimes play fast and loose with that, but they're on shaky ground. Uh, in contrast, a quasi-endowment is created by a congregation. It's when they have unrestricted funds and they decide that it's the best stewardship of this money to invest it and treat it as an endowment. Uh, why would you do that instead of spending the money all at once? Because a properly managed endowment over the long term will provide more money for mission and ministry than if you just spend the initial gift all at once. Uh, but you, you do have to pay attention to those words properly managed uh, endowment. Uh, with a quasi endowment, the paramount concern is fidelity to the mission of the church. And so if the mission changes, you should review your designation of the funds. Uh, these endowments exist to serve the church. The church does not exist to serve them. And I say that because I've seen churches turn endowments, quasi-endowments into icons. Uh, and you hear people say things like, we can never invade the principle. Uh, well, that's by and large true for a true endowment, but not at all true for a, a quasi-endowment. Uh, donors restrict and restrictions are enforceable. Congregations designate, designations can be changed. Uh, Some people will be inspired to generosity if they can make a restricted gift uh, and their passion for a specific use or cause might inspire uh, generosity. And we don't want to uh, close down that particular spigot, but we want to be careful. One way to do that is for the church to establish some broad categories. And when people uh, want to make a restricted gift uh, encourage them to uh, give to the fund that the church has created uh, so that you have more flexibility. So you might have a, a fund for worship that would include music, uh, a program fund that would include faith formation, uh, outreach that would be for uh, compassion extended outside of the congregation. Uh, this balances the donor's desire to fund something near and dear to the heart with giving the congregation some uh, flexibility. Uh, an example of uh, an application of the why, what, and how is the United Church of Christ. Uh, our why is God's vision uh, for creating a just world for all. Uh, what are, we do uh, is we welcome all, love all, and seek justice for all. And how do we do that? Uh, by loving God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength and our neighbor as ourselves. So that's one articulation. Uh, and each church can come up with their own. Uh, the second thing you need is some policies. Uh, you need an investment policy. You need uh, a drawdown policy. That's how much you will take out each year. You need a spending policy, which is what you will do with the money that you draw down. Uh, and your policies will be specific to whether you have endowments or quasi-endowments. Uh, very quickly, because I do other workshops on this, this is the list of things that you need in an investment policy. 
draw down. There are various approaches from uh, rainy day funds to formulas to uh, spending as much of it as you need to balance the budget, which isn't a recommended approach, but it is an approach. Uh, people should know that true endowments are subject to a law called the Uniform Prudent Management of Institutional Funds Act, uh, lovingly known as UPMIFA. Uh, and unless the donor uses very specific language to say that they don't want this law to apply to their endowment, uh, it, it governs uh, all uh, endowments and establishes uh, prudence rules. Uh, spending policy, uh, a pitfall sometimes churches fall into if they've got large enough endowments is the endowment will undermine individual generosity. I've seen churches where a myth uh, develops that, you know, we don't need to give because uh, the church is taken care of by the endowment. Uh, I, my guideline would be uh, always try to use endowment resources to somehow extend the mission and ministry beyond the means of the active members and make sure that your spending policy is linked to the why that you've discerned for your congregation and for uh, planned gifts. Uh, for identifying prospects, uh, most people begin to think about planned gifts uh, if they have children after their children have successfully been launched as adults or somehow provided for. Uh, that uh, adults without children are excellent prospects because they're going to give away presumably all their money. I read that 19 of the 20 largest bequests made to Dartmouth University came from adults without children. Uh, you want to look for people who are engaged with the congregation uh, because they have passion for what you're doing and who are committed to the mission and ministry of the church. Uh, and then you have to ask people, and as I've already said, uh, writing a letter, making an announcement, uh, inviting them to a workshop doesn't count as asking. Uh, education may be necessary, uh, but it is not sufficient. Uh, broadcasting is very inefficient and low yield. Uh, the mantra in, in fundraising is you have to have the right person uh, to ask and to do the asking at the right time, the right place, and to ask for the right amount of money. And that's a lot of things to get right, uh, and that shouldn't intimidate you. Uh, but the right person to be doing the asking will, among other things, already have made a planned gift. Uh, if a committee is asking, all of the members uh, should have made a planned gift. Uh, but don't get so stuck on this that you can't move forward. Uh, as Wayne Gretzky said, 100% of the shots you don't take don't go in. Um, but uh, if you can uh, do your best to, to think about all of these right ways to do things, it'll certainly help you. Uh, you could consider creating a legacy society, uh, which is uh, a group of people that uh, have all made gifts and uh, it becomes a little more structured way to ask people. Uh, you ask them to join the society. These societies usually have annual events that gather together to celebrate the people and the gifts that they have made uh, and to induct new members into the legacy society. Uh, so it provides a little more structure around the process of asking people. Um, in churches that have effectively got these things going, uh, it, it does make it a more routine expectation for people to make planned gifts because they see that the other people in the congregation have done that. They can see all of the members of the people that are in the Legacy Society. Uh, so it is a good way uh, to, to move ahead, but you still want to invite people face to face to join the Legacy Society, uh, you, you want to ask effectively. Uh, some tips for asking. Uh, up on our stewardship website uh, under the uh, 
the webinar that we did for planned giving, there's a couple of resources that you can look at. Uh, one is kind of an outline for how to have a meeting uh, to ask somebody to make a gift. Uh, typically, you're going to send out people in pairs. Uh, that's scriptural. Uh, and uh, one person is going to be the asker and the other is going to be the, the support person, the, the wing person. Uh, one or both of them should have made a planned gift. Uh, it's possible for the pastor to be a part of this team and that can be uh, very effective if the pastor is comfortable with the role. Uh, you want your team to do some practicing ahead of time, do role playing, uh, find somebody that's friendly that they can uh, hold a mock asking session with. Uh, you want to make a face-to-face -face request for a face-to-face -face meeting. This is leveraging the fact that we know our donors and see them frequently. So we want to catch them at coffee hour or at church uh, or find some other way uh, to uh, engage with them. Uh, we want to make sure we connect with these people in ways that convey to them that we care about them and not just their money. Uh, so connections for the things that they're passionate about at the church, uh, that they're passionate about in life. Uh, we want to be direct. Uh, we want to tell them why we're there. Uh, and we want to ask very specifically for them to uh, make a gift uh, most often giving them at least a couple of options to consider so it's not a yes, no question. Uh, and then after we've made an ask, we need to shut up and wait for the prospect to say something. Uh, and this is a problem that inexperienced uh, people making asks, they they don't stop talking or they don't make the ask directly. And so they never really get an answer because they haven't given uh, the, the person the opportunity to answer. Uh, so after you've waited for an answer, um, and uh, the answer most frequently, according to studies, is maybe. Uh, some people will say yes right away. Uh, some will say no. Uh, a lot of people will say I need to think about it. So then you want to make sure you have a, a process for following through, regardless of what the answer is. Whatever they say, you're going to thank them for their time together, thank them for their engagement with the church and its ministry, uh, even if they've said no. Uh, and uh, we're going to follow through if they say yes or maybe. Uh, and we are going to thank everybody uh, never overlooking an opportunity. We're going to be as personal as we can be. Uh, and here's a place where there are some people who are just not cut out to ask people to give money. Uh, and we can encourage them. We can provide uh, coaching and resources. Um, but some people are not going to be good askers. Well, we can ask them to be our good thankers and to uh, find ways to uh, make sure that people are recognized for their gifts. Uh, and we want to tell our stories uh, because people respond to stories. Uh, consider having a legacy book that records all gifts as they are received and maybe you can reach back into history uh, to try to do that so that you can not lose track of, you can honor people, and make sure that you celebrate the gifts from earlier generations. So here we are uh, uh, on All Hallows' Eve. Uh, you know, on All Saints' Day, make part of your church liturgy recognition for the gifts from earlier generations, uh, perhaps raising up specific people and uh, individual gifts. Uh, as appropriate. That'll help us tell our story that will help people to know that they'll be remembered uh, for their gifts. I want to say just a few words about capital campaigns. Uh, this is a planned giving campaign, uh, a workshop. Uh, capital campaigns often include a planned gift element uh, when you read about the colleges and universities that raise billions of dollars in their capital campaigns, 
they are counting bequests and plan gifts as pledges to their capital campaign when they get up to those kind of big numbers. Uh, it's healthy for churches to have a capital campaign every five to 10 years. It gives people an opportunity to give out of assets or savings. Uh, do not be afraid. Uh, most churches find that capital campaigns are important and positive events in the life of the church. And they do not reduce annual giving because most people will be giving out of savings or assets, not out of income. Uh, there's almost never a bad time for a capital campaign, uh, except when the church has active or unresolved conflict, or if the senior pastor or pastor is in the process of leaving, probably not the best time uh, to launch a campaign. And consultants are absolutely worth it uh, for major campaigns. Uh, what's a major campaign uh, usually, uh, you know, two to three times annual pledging. Uh, why are they worth it? Because you will raise more money working with a consultant than you will if you don't work with the consultant. Uh, it's not that they have any magic formula. Uh, the, the techniques for capital campaigns are really well known. Uh, you can buy a capital campaign manual from the United Church of Christ but they will give you courage and encourage you to not cut corners. They'll coach you about uh, how to make asks and how to be effective. Uh, the UCC has planned giving resources <clears throat> on their website. They have a planned giving manual, which you can buy in print or download from their website chapter by chapter. There are organizations dedicated to planned giving uh, there's no secret sauce or recipes. The rules, for instance, for life income gifts are the same for all organizations uh, defined by statute. Uh, there are some great books. Uh, my favorite book is A Spirituality of Fundraising. It's really a brochure more than a book. Uh, but if you are hesitant about asking uh, people after you've read this book, you will feel better. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, Cliff Christopher is also another excellent uh, author, uh, and he addresses uh, planned giving in uh, his books as well. Uh, there are good e-newsletters. Uh, I subscribe to several of these, and uh, the the Leading Ideas newsletter from the Lewis Center for Church Leadership, which covers much more than stewardship, uh, always seems to have uh, excellent uh, articles and links in their, their weekly uh, newsletter. And again, uh, we have resources on our website. <music>